Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming and for joining this uh, session of the virtual seminars uh, in economic theory. Uh, today we, we have uh, Paolo Barelli from Rochester, who is going to present the strategic foundations of rational expectations, uh, joined with uh, Srihari Govindan and Robert Wilson. And uh, we thank our guest panelist, who is Jerome Swinkels. The format of this uh, seminar is as follows. We have a 60 minute uh, presentation with time for interim questions from the panelists. Uh, we encourage the audience to participate. And uh, if you have a question, you can just uh, raise your hand and uh, talk through the, through the presentation. Uh, at the end, uh, we'll have uh, the opportunity to ask questions live in the Q&A session. Um, and just to let you know that the talk is recorded. Uh, before I hand over to Paolo, let me invite you to our seminar next week. We will have uh, Stephen Morris, who is going to present his paper, Screening with uh, Persuasion, joined with Dirk uh, Bergeman and Tibor uh, Human. Guest panelists are Ellen Moore and Andreas uh, Klein. More information you can find on our website or on Twitter. Uh, so thank you, uh, pa Paolo, the screen is yours. Oh, thank you, Spiros. Uh, just one quick thing. I, I just got a notice that uh, the recording was stopped. I don't know if that happened. I don't know if it's only on, on my end. But anyways, just check if you want to record this. So, uh, well, okay, now recording in progress. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, as Spiros mentioned, uh, this is a paper with uh, Hari and Bob. Uh, Hari is my colleague here in Rochester. Bob is at uh, Stanford, and uh, I think you you know who these people are. If you don't, you should. Bob is a Nobel Prize winner, and he's uh, he was he's a laureate. Uh, and when he was awarded, we were already working on this project, and uh, it, it has to do his uh, uh, his achievement have to do with uh, with his work on ideas related to what we're going to present here. So there's a little bit of a you know, uh, credence to what we do here. Okay, strategic foundations of, of efficient rational expectations. So what's the story? Uh, we're gonna talk about the uh, strategic foundations for fully revealing rational expectations equilibrium. That's the question. And uh, so what, what does it mean? It means that uh, take a model or setting where you can find, or uh, there is a fully revealing rational expectations equilibrium, a competitive equilibrium, uh, is an economy of incomplete information. Rational expectations is, an, is a price mapping that maps states to, to, to numbers. The, take an environment where one exists and is fully revealing, reviews the state. The question is whether you can find a sequence of uh, auctions or mechanisms in general with ever increasing number of participants and equilibria of these auctions that yield, the, that yield clearing prices that converge to the fully revealing rational expectations. That's the question, okay? It's, it's an old question. Uh, we, there's a hurdle that is known that uh, if you want to do that with auctions, auctions are discontinuous. So there's a problem of existence of equilibrium. But uh, more than that, I mean, since we're looking for efficiency, so the, 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 the environment that we have has some built-in monotonicity. So we do have, uh, uh, you know, powerful techniques to, to establish existence of equilibria even under discontinuities, or even when we deal with discontinuities using bid grids, uh, like the techniques uh, pioneered by Susan Athey, uh, single crossing kind of ideas. Um, but the single crossing fails whenever we have uh, asymmetry. That's a well-documented fact, and, and Phil Rennie is, uh, is at the forefront of documenting this. Um, uh, so th there is an issue, right? So the techniques that we have to provide existence of equilibrium may fail. So then there's, there's a hurdle over here. There's a beautiful paper by Rennie and, and Perry in 2006 that kind of did that. I mean, they found a way of uh, uh, dealing with the hurdle uh, they, because they consider a double, a double auction. So it's an asymmetric model because they're, they're buyers and sellers, but they are otherwise identical. So there is like a minimal amount of asymmetry and that's already enough to break down single crossing properties. So they had to, to work hard to establish that in their setting, uh, rational expectations of equilibrium have foundations by means of uh, double auctions. Now, the, the open question is what about, uh, you know, real heterogeneity? Uh, not only you have double auctions, buyers and sellers, but you may have 
uh, different, uh, like substantially different kinds of people, different, different utility functions, different information. That's what we set out to do in this project. Uh, our contribution is that we identify a setting where the question can be analyzed in general. So uh, I'll, I'll be clear about that. We allow for a finite number of different types. So Rennie and Perry is a special case with just one such type. So we allow for finitely many. Theorists in the audience are going to say, well, finitely many, what about infinitely many? I'll talk more about that uh, when the time comes. But we already, even with finally many, uh, we already have, a, uh, we already find a, a substantial, I would say, new result because we characterize the attainability of efficient allocations. Not even talking about rational expectations of equilibrium yet, it's just efficiency. In our setting with heterogeneous agents, uh, traders, efficiency is characterized. You can obtain, attain efficiency using mechanisms. If and only if uh, the efficient allocation satisfies a monotonicity property, you know, it's monotonicity. So it would remind you of um, in, in mechanism design, other monotonicity conditions like masking monotonicity. It's not, it's a, it's a different kind of monotonicity that uh, we'll talk in, in, in a bit. And you, sh you should know that it's different because I haven't talked about the uh, uh, implementability yet. I'm just talking about the attainability. And this is like a, a, a subst I think is a substantial new result, the characterization of attainability by mechanisms in, in the form of this condition, monotonicity. Okay, that shows up because we allow for heterogene heterogeneous types. Uh, without monotonicity, it's therefore, there is no hope for strategic foundations because uh, in, in mechanisms, like in auctions, let's just stop, start with auctions. Auctions cannot even attain efficiency. But the result is more general. Uh, in a class of mechanisms that uh, satisfy a salient feature of auctions, those mechanisms cannot attain efficiency and let alone you know, provide strategic, of course, it's not going to provide strategic foundations for rational expectations because you cannot get the efficient allocation. That's, the, that's a crucial, substantial uh, negative result. We also have a positive side to our, to our project that is under monotonicity, life is good. So it's like the, 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 the punchline here. Under monotonicity, life is good. Without monotonicity, it's a whole can of worms. Things are complicated. When under monotonicity, we can show that there is a fully revealing rational expectation of equilibrium that induces the efficient allocation. Right? It reveals, the, it reveals the, the state and induces efficiency under monotonicity. Oh, and, can I ask a question? Of course. You're, you're talking about rational expectations, at yeah. equilibrium, whether that can be achieved through an auction, and then you're also talking about efficient allocations, whether those can be achieved. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you're talking as if those are the same thing. Are no, they maybe, or are, or the like rational expectation has to be efficient? No, or? that's a that's a very good question. I'm going to clarify. It, it, it's 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 fair. Uh, the the primary question is whether we can achieve efficiency, uh, and because. There is also a question is that, uh, that there are situations where efficiency can be obtained with rational expectations and we cannot achieve it. So those are different questions. You're right about that, right? So it's gonna be clear when, when, I, when I give you the results and, and, and illustration, but you're, you're, you're right. Where the, the starting question was rational expectations and we, I moved, I switched to efficiency because the, the, the problem is more severe than rational expectations. We cannot even get to efficiency to begin with. Okay, but thanks for the question, but back to the, to to the life being good not only you, you there is a rational expectations the equilibrium that is fully revealing and induces efficiency under monotonicity you we can provide strategic foundations with auctions actually right there's a sequence of equilibrium auctions that uh, that uh, implement i'm saying inducing implement the allocation and the clearing price uh, of a rational expectation okay, that's the contribution let me talk about the literature, there's a huge literature here. I will highlight uh, Bob. Bob started it in 1977. Uh, there's Milgram, of course, Milgram Weber, everybody knows. Uh, Bob is here again. You know, your own is hearing two fantastic contributions, Pessendorf and Swinkos, Scripps and Swinkos, fantastic papers. Uh, and, you know, the literature is, is, is 
is is uh, is is extends and has provided strategic foundations under some conditions. Typically, we have private values or, or symmetric bidders, right? So the the private uh, so those are like a, of course. Uh, Crips and Swinkos allow for a more general model than we have as far as uh, we, we're going to have a unit demand and unit supply. This one allows for multiple objects. But the the the, the question that we want to analyze is, is the one in the Milgram Weber kind of setting uh, with asymmetries, like we have uh, interdependence and affiliation. So we don't we want to go beyond private values and, and symmetry, right? I mentioned Uranian Zamir because that's the one paper that gets existence under this setting of interdependence and, and uh, affiliation, uh, dealing with uh, the lack of single crossing, but that's just a single unit first price auction. The, the one that I mentioned before is, is the crucial one. That's the one that's our starting point. Rennie and Perry, they obtain existing equilibrium and large double auctions with symmetric bidders and sellers that provides foundations for rational expectations and efficiency because in their setting, uh, the uh, efficient allocation is monotone, as you see in a bit, okay? Anyways, let me move on to the model. I only have one hour, right? So let me go a little faster. We have, uh, the model is general enough to accommodate auctions and double auctions, either only buyers or buyers and sellers. I0 is a set of buyers, I1 is a set of sellers. We have unit demand and unit supply. Buyers are always strategic. In, in a competitive economy, they say yes or no, if they want the object, when they see the price. If, if it's in a mechanism, they, they, they send messages. Sellers are not necessarily strategic. Uh, when they are not strategic, they're just uh, uh, placeholders for, for objects, for copies of the object. When they're strategic, they again say yes or no in a competitive economy and, and uh, send messages in the mechanism. We're just going to use notation mu1 and mu0 for the fraction of uh, uh, goods versus total. Mu0 is, is one minus mu1. And here's the, the, the setting. We have uh, uh, hidden states in a one-dimensional interval. Let's call it 0, 01. Hidden signals for each type of, uh, of, uh, of player, also 0, 01. We have a prior on, on, the, on, the, on the product space. And we're going to have a valuation that depends on uh, the state, the hidden state, and the private signal. So interdependence is rotated through the state, right? So my signal reveals some information about the state, and therefore my signal is important to you, right? That's the that's the setting of Rennie and Perry. Um, let me uh, what I'm going to do here. Let me give you the maintained assumptions. We're going to assume that P has a density and uh, has a, it's it have condition independence. Given the state, the state the signals are drawn independently. Uh, the the density satisfies strict MLRP. I will say that this uh, we can relax that, and in the paper we do we use a, a we order by first order stochastic dominance, but which is for the positive result that's a good thing. But for the negative result, the more assumptions we get, the, 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 the better, the, more, the stronger the negative result. Anyways, strictly MLRP is also the, 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 the condition assumed by Rennie and Terry. We are going to assume that VI is continuous, increasing the state is strictly increasing the signal. We don't assume any differentiability. Uh, and uh, we assume a condition that is, an, is a non-degeneracy condition that basically says, uh, there isn't a set of uh, traders that always value the object, the uh, unit more than the, the complement. So, and, and satisfy feasibility. Let's say there are 10 objects and there are 10 people that always want it um, way more than the rest of the society. So that's a trivial allocation. Just give it to them, right? So we assume away the the, not the, the gener degenerate case. Hello. Okay. Tell me. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. You've, um, you've ruled out pure common values here. Is that... Yeah very crucial to what you do or somewhat crucial it's crucial for the positive results not for the negative okay so even if we had pure common values we're still screwed without monotonicity is that is that the summary yeah okay exactly. thank you mm -hmm. so uh that the model i just presented is like uh, the original model we're gonna oh. we're gonna go to the limit we're gonna replicate we're gonna do the, like a classical construction we replicate the the, the population and we replicate maintaining the, the, the structure of, of the what's being replicated. 
uh, we just, if you had like a hundred traders to begin with, like 60 buyers and 40 sellers, eventually going to have a thousand, 600 buyers and 400 sellers and so on and so on, right? So we keep replicating until, until the limit. Uh, we, we take the product space of signal. So now uh, if I'm a, for the original trader and the original model, he's going to have a, a, you know, a family of uh, clones. Each one of them is going to get his signal. Uh, and, and they're all exactly the same within the family, but each one is going to get a different signal in the, in the play of the, in the, in the realization of the, of the information. Uh, and of course, we can extend the uh, probabilities to like lists of sequences of signals by condition independence. So we just did this uh, standard construction. We can go to the limit. And the limit is like a Komogorov's Komo extension. Right? Just the limit, a countable number of uh, agents, finitely many countable families of clones. So the finitely many levels of heterogeneity are present. We, do, we don't increase the level of heterogeneity as we increase the population. Uh, this is a restriction. We do that because uh, we want to have a well-defined probability space in the limit, and uh, and that's what we that's what we get. We can extend the probability along the way to a p star defined in the, in the huge Cartesian product. That's a well-defined probability space where we can make our probabilistic uh, statements. Uh, if we, if the heterogeneity were to increase with the population, we we would we could run into problems. Of course, if the speed that the heterogeneity increases is slow compared to the speed of uh, increasing the population, then maybe we still have a well-defined space in the limit. And, uh, but again, I can just uh, stop talking about this and say, look, the negative result requires two levels of, of, of uh, uh, two different types. And uh, as long as you have more than one, we can already have the negative result. So the fact that we fix the number of, uh, uh, asymmetries along the way is is not crucial. I mean, it's, it, it, it is what it is, but uh, you know, for the negative result, we already get it, we finally made. Just for notation, let's use PI as the CDF from now on, right? PI was a distribution, now is the CDF. Um, uh, as Emre asked the question in, in correctly, so we're gonna first talk about efficiency, okay? It's a quasi-linear setting, efficiency is sum of valuations. So for any, any replica N, you just solve this problem, you find efficient allocation, and it happens to be a cutoff allocation. There's a cutoff chi I N of omega and X N, X N is a profile signals. If you're above that, you should get a, a unit. If you're below that, you should not get a unit on efficiency grounds. That's for the finite replica. In the limit, we have the following construction. I mean, the limit, uh, the cutoffs along the way converge to this cutoff here, the, the chi star, that is the solution of this problem. And you see the, 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 the benefits of working with well-defined probability space. This is just strong law of large numbers, right? So we are maximizing the surplus. It, it starts at xi and goes up to one. And, and the feasibility here is like the people that are below, right? So it, it, it follows by simple uh, algebra argument that uh, this, but anyways, that this is the problem in the limit. But anyways, that's a lemma that says the solution to this problem uh, is the limit of solutions of, 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 of cutoffs along the way. So that's efficiency. It's, efficiency is a cutoff kind of situation. If, if you're above a particular signal, you should get it. If you're below, you should not get it. Uh, let me give you an example. So we fix ideas. Before replication, we have two types of traders and one object. So this could be an auction with two bidders and one object or, or a double auction with a buyer and a seller. Uh, so two levels of uh, asymmetry. Trader one is private values. His value is just his signal. Trader two has interdependent values. So there's an omega right here, right? So lambda times omega plus x2. So uh, that is, anyways, that's trader two. Trader one's information is highly informative because uh, uh, it, it moves to the right with the, with the, with the state. So, of course, when I say bracket, bracket into zero, between zero and one, because I want this to be a distribution, this is basically saying as a state goes from zero to, to one, the distribution of X1 is uniform between zero and a third, and it moves until a, thir a third to two thirds. So really stochastic dominance, it satisfies the properties that we, we have in the paper. It doesn't satisfy strictly MLRP, but we can, you know, 
perturb it and, and satisfy our conditions. Uh, the information of two is, I mean, two is not informed of anything, it's just a uniform distribution. So in a sense, we have two different types and they are polar opposites, right? One private values and highly informative uh, distributions, the other one interdependent values, but uh, uninformative, uh, uninformative distribution. Now you solve the maximization problem and you get this. Uh, you get that uh, uh, the cutoffs are what they are. There's some min and max because I'm bracketing things between zero and one, but the key, uh, key aspect is to see that uh, there is a three over here and a minus in front of it. I don't know if you can see that, if, if I have a cursor or not. Uh, you know, we could have uh, already guessed that the, the, there's a lambda here as a parameter and there's a three. The, the relation between lambda and three is, is important. And actually the relation between lambda and a third, because uh, if uh, lambda is greater than a third, then the cutoff of uh, type two is decreasing. This was to us a big surprise, okay? I, I'm, I'm being honest here. We did not know that this was possible. What's happening? What's happening is because as lambda is large, uh, the state is super important for trader two. So as the state increases, efficiency tells us that we have to give it give objects to copies to trader two. But the information also says that the types of uh, signals of trader one are more way more likely to be high. So then for us to get uh, the efficient allocation, we have to decrease the cutoff of, uh, of trader two. So you have more people above. So that that's is the interplay of uh, of uh, the information and uh, and uh, interdependence that is leading to this situation that uh, the cutoff of one of the types can be decreasing in the state. You cannot have all of them decreasing because you have a monotone environment. Some of them is always going to be increasing, but the example already shows that if lambda is greater than a third, the cutoff can be decreasing. That's the finding that we have. Uh, that is that is the monotonicity thing that uh, I alluded to in the beginning. When all cutoffs are increasing in the state, we say that efficient allocation is monotone. When it's not, some of them are not, we say it's not monotone. And this is going to turn out to be a crucial property for the purposes of our analysis. Okay. Um, since I, I don't have too much time, I only have one hour, I'm going to skip this one. I'm just going to say there is a condition in the literature proposed by Vijay Krishna, average crossing. Average crossing is a sufficient condition for monotonicity. But, you know, uh, if you have time in the, in the end, I'll talk about that. Uh, it it kind of says that uh, monotonicity has to do with how heterogeneous we allow agents to be. The symmetric case, it's clearly monotone and because clearly it satisfies uh, average crossing or, or you need asymmetries. And, and this would be a measure of how heterogeneous the situation is. I'm gonna skip that just for the in, in interest of time, okay? If you have time in the end, I'll come back to you. So efficiency is this, cut off, and it need not be monotone. Now let's go to a competitive economy so we can talk about rational expectations of equilibrium. What is the what is a, uh, uh, a price map? Is a map that maps states to numbers. Uh, in, in the limit, we can talk about the demand I mean, or even before, uh, demand for a trader of type I, which is this, you look at the price, you check whether your expected value is greater than the price, you want it. If it's less, you don't want it. You take demand, you, you define excess demand by this limit of means uh, criterion. Uh, and uh, in the double auction, if it's an if it's a auction, you would uh, subtract the, the, the number of objects to, to have a well-defined object. By strong law of large numbers, this excess demand is just that. It just, uh, you, it just pops up, is just mu zero i minus the sum of the CDFs. And uh, then, uh, well, what is a rational expectation? The equilibrium is a price map that uh, gives you uh, zero excess demand, right? Competitive solution. And we're gonna call it fully, re fully revealing if it's strictly increasing, right? So uh, th this is, this is just definitions, it's well defined. Everything is, is, works because we have this nice model, uh, probability model in the limit. Uh, anyways, that's rational expectations equilibrium. If it's fully revealing, uh, it's strictly increasing. So by observing the price, you know the state and then your decision is, is trivial. Just look at your value and compare and say yes or no. Now, uh, if you look at uh, 
the optimization problem, the maximization problem that defines efficiency, is you solve the problem, you see that you, 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 you understand that the, at the cutoff, the values have to be equalized. So that gives us a, a candidate for a rational expectation of equilibrium, this one. Just take a price map that uh, is the value at the cutoff. We're maximizing, we're taking, we're taking the type that has a positive cutoff, not a zero guy, because if you, yeah, it's, it's one candidate for a, for a rational expectation of equilibrium. It's not easy, not difficult, sorry, I'm gonna say easy. It's, it's relatively simple to verify this. This is a continuous and monotone rational expectation of equilibrium that induces uh, alpha star, induces. Alpha star being monotone or not, this rational expectation of equilibrium is going to get to it. It's going to generate. It's, that's going to be the outcome, the 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 the, the allocation co coming from the, the competitive solution, right? So that's just one candidate. We could have constructed it differently. This one works, and and we have this uh, result for this construction. We know that when the allocation is monotone, the efficient allocation is monotone. This guy is unique. So that kind of answers your question, maybe, Henry. So. We're talking about efficient allocation, if it's monotone, then there is unique fully revealing rational expectation of equilibrium. And if we're able to achieve the, 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 the allocation, then we're also providing uh, strategic foundations for rational expectations of equilibrium. So again, when alpha is monotone, alpha is star, life is good. Let me go back to, exam to the example to tell you that uh, life can be complicated uh, uh, outside monotonicity. Uh, that construction that I gave in the beginning tells us that the that uh, the the Russian expectation of equilibrium is just the cutoff of player one because player one has type, trader one has private values, so it's it's, it's fully revealing. See, uh, beautiful. If lambda is less than two thirds, which includes the case that lambda is greater than a third, that's a unique one. So there is a situation where I have a unique rational expectation of equilibrium inducing the efficient outcome, and the efficient outcome is non monotone. Okay. That's what I just told you. Uh, and you know, if lambda is greater than two thirds, we can construct a family of, uh, uh, we can construct other, rational, uniqueness is done. You can construct another one. You can even, if it's, if it's super large, like four, larger than four thirds, you can construct an entire family of rational expectations of equilibrium, which kind of, uh, it's what I was alluding to. Whenever you, you don't have monotonicity, a uh, whole can of arms is open. Uh, there's an entire family of rational expectations of equilibrium, some of them fully revealing, some of them completely non-revealing, some of them partially revealing. So there is, uh, without monotonicity, there's a lot of indeterminacy in this eco in economy using the competitive model. Anyways, this is something to keep in mind, right? Uh, that monotonicity is, is so important for uh, what we're doing. Now, finally, I'm gonna get to what I need to be. So it's 11.30, I think it's good. Uh, we talked about efficiency, we talked about rational expectations. Now let's talk about uh, trying to implement it, trying to provide strategic foundations. So we're going to use mechanisms. Uh, mechanisms, just a game form uh, that uh, for uh, along the, the replicas, including the limit, each trader is going to send a message from the same uh, space of uh, messages, MI, an abstract space. Um, I guess philosophically, because we are replicating, you know, traders of uh, type I are just my clones. It kind of makes sense that uh, the messages they have is the same that I have. You know, we can allow for M to depend on, on the cohort. That's the, it's more general we can, we, we do in the paper, but for presentation purposes, let's just keep like that. And even philosophically kind of, you know, if my brother is coming in, he's just like me, why would he have access to other messages? Anyways, a mechanism, Everybody sends messages, a designer collects the messages, sets a price, which is of secondary importance. The, the most important thing is an allocation, decides who gets a, a copy or not. A and you have to satisfy feasibility because you know you have only so many copies to allocate, right? Feasibility along the way is, is not a problem. Feasibility uh, in the limit requires that uh, messages are sent. Uh, each one of my clones plays the same strategy, like a, a type symmetric profile, because otherwise we cannot do law of large numbers. So along the way, we can allow for any kinds of, uh, you know, of crazy strategies, but in the limit, we're gonna restrict to, for type symmetric strategies so that we can define the limit object. Anyways, 
the important thing, conceptual thing. Look at this mechanism, the direct mechanism. Uh, the, uh, the message space is the signal space. So we're in the limit. Every one of us, every one of my brothers, they get their signal and they report the signal. The designer looks at this finally many countable, countable families and knows the state with probability one, right? So because uh, you, you know the state for sure, you can, you, and you know what the rational expectation price is, you can just say, that's the price. And I know what the efficient allocation is. That's the efficient allocation because I know everything. I know the I know x infinity and I know the state. So this mechanism, direct mechanism, not only attains but implements efficiency and rational expectations, right? Trivially, uh, and because it's a direct mechanism, uh, we know that uh, there is an indirect mechanism. There are indirect mechanisms that are going to do that, right? Uh, what is the problem with this mechanism? And this is uh, something, uh, I'll talk about that. So, so let's say that alpha star is not monotone, the efficient allocation. It takes two sequences of two profiles of signals where the JK coordinate is the same and the IK prime, IK prime coordinate is the same in the other profile, in, in, across profiles. Let's say that uh, you know the, the J trader is, is monotone uh, so the cutoff is monotone for the J trader, but it's monotone increasing, and the other guy is monotone decreasing for the I guy, right? See, uh, the uh, omega prime is greater than omega state, right? Then what happens is that uh, uh, in the profile Y, uh, trader I K prime gets it, and trader J K doesn't get it, and in the profile X and X, it's the opposite. So in words. The message M beats the message M prime in the profile oh. X infinity. Tell me. Who, who's okay? Go ahead. Hello. Okay, sorry. If there was no question, anyways, you can ask anytime. What I want to say is M beats M prime in one profile and M prime beats M in the other. No. Again, somebody's talking. Anyways. So I want to say that this is a this is something, okay? Uh, of course, an auction cannot do that because if I bid 100 and 100 bids 50, it cannot be the case that 50 is going to bid 100 because you have a natural order of real numbers. So, uh, so that's the salient property of auctions that I mentioned in the beginning. If a mechanism doesn't allow for that, we're we're gonna we're gonna look for mechanisms in 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 a class that doesn't allow for that, because again the original question had to do with auctions and auctions don't satisfy that. You know, one referee looked at this uh, when we first realized that we call this independence of irrelevant alternatives, and one referee looked at that and say, yeah, it is what it is. It's because this is saying you take two messages and the way you rank those two messages is independent independent of the rest, right? Uh, that, that's what we want to. That's what we want to achieve. Actually, let me just tell you what we want to achieve. Right? I'm going to call you. Uh, um, I'm going to give you the definition in a minute. I'm going to call it pairwise rank independence, because if we call it independence of relevant alternatives, we're, there's a connotation that that's a good thing, and we certainly don't want to have a connotation that this is good or bad. It's just a salient feature of auctions. You know, I can try to defend it by saying if if a mechanism satisfies this property, then the designer. In terms of uh, implementing the mechanism, or implement not implement implementing in, in making the me mechanism operational, once those two messages show up, he already knows what to do, right? Uh, already knows that if this this message got didn't get it, this other message is not going to get it either. So there's a sense of a complexity grounds that you can defend this for for the for the operation of the mechanism. But in any case, that's the let me define pairwise rate independence. Fix a mechanism. And take a message profile with two messages, M upper bar, M lower bar, and those being the coordinates of those messages, IK and I prime K prime. And let's say that the IK guy gets it, the I prime K uh, is more likely to get it than the other one. So the allocation, if, if the allocation is zero one, is one guy gets it, the other guy doesn't, right? Let's say that a mechanism, we're gonna say that a mechanism satisfies pairwise rake independence, if for any other profile where this M upper bar and M lower bar are the coordinates, <laughs> like are the 
the, cor the, the, the corresponding coordinates. Coordinates. It, it must be the case that uh, the one sending the message m bar, m upper bar, if uh, cannot lose whenever the the one sending the message m lower bar. Right. That's exactly what uh, the previous slide gave us. It turns out that uh, uh, we, there's a one extra piece that we need for the proof the, of the result that's coming. There's also the case that uh, a given a fixed trader, if, if he sends the message m, m upper bar, fixing the messages of the other, he can, and m upper bar is the one that uh, we just defined above, it cannot be that, that switching to m lower bar, he does better in terms of uh, uh, obtaining the object. So fixing the others, right? So we need that for the proof. Again, uh, it's, a, it's a property of auctions, right? Because again, 100 is greater than 50 no matter what. And, and, and this is kind of saying, uh, in, in general abstract sense, we want an order of messages, like a pre-order of messages that allows us to look at this message and say, well, this message is better than this one, but messages can be ar arbitrary things, can be, you know, could be a normal form of a game. It could be like some crazy function, but we want to order them uh, based on, on this principle that comes from auctions. Of course, a, a uniform price auction is a, any auction is, is a PRI mechanism. And, and we can, def uniform price auction is the standard thing in the literature, right? So you just submit bids and asks, or if it's a double auction, you order them, and you, you find a point where you, there are the number of copies of objects above, those are the guys that get it, the rest don't get it, and the price is some, something in between, like the uniform price between the lowest uh, winning bid and the highest uh, uh, losing ask, right? Winning ask, right? Anyways, we can do that for uh, along the way. We can also define something in the limit, right? Uh, and this is not an auction. We're gonna call it limit auction, it's limit mechanism. It's just an auxiliary object that says, let's define a clearing price that happens to be the one that uh, clears markets. That's this row infinity thing. And define payoffs as, as you would, right? So there's a, uh, you, you get, is V minus P, that's a quasi-linear payoff, with a tie-breaking rule that satisfies feasibility, right? So we, that's, we have the details in the paper. We can define a, an object in the limit that will be useful for us. And of course, it, it is a PRI mechanism. I, again, because auctions, uh, the, the message spaces are the real numbers, and there is a natural order that satisfies all these properties. Okay, so we talk about, that's the class of mechanism we're gonna talk about for replicas and also in the limit. In the limit, we can define a, uh, a mechanism and when it's an auction, that's the one I just defined. Uh, and now the, the, the main question, attainability of the efficient allocation. Let's define a random variable. That is, look at what it is. It's just, uh, you take the, the sequence of uh, messages and you, and, and signals, and uh, we're talking about the signals that are above the cutoff. Those are the guys that should get the allocation in the limit. And these are the guys that uh, are gonna get the allocation in the, in the mechanism. So we have a, let's say, let's say it's all zeros and ones. We want this guy to be one, this one to be one, whenever this one is one. That's what we want. That's the, the idea of uh, the intuition for why this would implement Right, so because if you're putting zeros when there's a one, this, the, this number is gonna be less than, than what it should be. And of course we allow for mixed strategies, uh, or whatever kind. So let's just uh, extend, uh, take the expected value of that random variable. The random variable that yields the proportion of type i's whose assignment of a unit agrees with the efficient, uh, uh, the one in the limit, right? So that's the random variable of interest. We want this random variable to converge to the mass of people above the cutoff. That's what we mean by asymptotically attainability. Uh, there, is a, there exists a sequence of mechanisms and a corresponding sequence of profiles of strategies. General strategies don't need to be type symmetric or can be behavior strategies, such that for each I in almost every state, that random variable converges in probability to the mass above the cutoff, okay? In a sense, that's a weak requirement because we're allowing for convergence in probability. This is the, the, the concept used elsewhere in the literature. So yeah, we should, we, we anyways, it, it's, it, it is the one to be used because uh, if, if we insisted in uh, strong convergence that you know maybe a, a weak convergence result would, would give us that. Anyways, this is what we're, the definition of being asymptotically attainable. 
And being attainable is the limit. If there's a limit object that uh, coincides with the with the with the efficient allocation, the allocation of the limit object coincides. Okay, that's definition of attainability, and here's our main result. Okay, the main result says monotonicity is equivalent to that. So if it's monotone, then it's asymptotically attainable. Sorry, if it's asymptotically attainable by mechanisms in that class that includes auctions, then it's monotone. If it's monotone, it's attainable via the limit auction, right? So there is one limit mechanism. I already gave one, define it, but it, it could be any other mechanism. There are other mechanisms that would do that. We're just using the auction to, to highlight the centrality of auctions in, in our analysis. And of course, if it's attainable by a limit auction, it's also attainable by auctions along the way. As, as, as Paulo, tell me. Paulo, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. a very stupid question. Uh, so attainability has nothing to do with equilibrium. Exactly. Or am I missing? Okay, uh, yes, fine. No, that's fantastic. Thanks for asking, because this is the point, right? We were trying to get, uh, we were banging our heads because we couldn't find equilibria. We couldn't find equilibrium when the thing was not monotone. And there was nothing to do with the best responses. It was just that. It's just that you, you don't find the allocation in the payoff matrix of the, of the mechanism. It's not there. So we all know uh, the, the conflict, the, the, the trade-off between efficiency and, and, and incentives. It's not that. This, uh, this is efficiency and uh, achieving it with mechanisms that has this feature of, uh, of auctions. I think I, I started saying that, I don't, I don't think I finished. The same referee that wanted us to not call it uh, independence or relevant alternatives also have had a pretty nice uh, thing to say. Look, this property of auctions is a dumb property <laughs> because uh, uh, it's a it is what it is. Auctions satisfy this property and we want to analyze a class of mechanisms that satisfy this property. Maybe the mechanisms we should be looking don't satisfy this property. We don't know what they are. Okay. And our original idea was to provide strategic foundation with auctions. Auctions cannot do that. I can already, uh, as already gave you, kind of some justifications for why uh, PRI is, is desirable, but I'm not going to say that it's not, not done, right? Because it, it's a property of auctions because we have a, a linear order in, in the masses. Anyways. I, I'm not going to go through the proof. I'll tell you that uh, the, the, the result that three implies two is what I've already told you. The difficult one is that one implies two. And to achieve that, uh, you know, there, there's some work. You, you, we, we kind of uh, cook up uh, like a, a Bernoulli experiment and then use Chebyshev thing. So for that, we need, we need a careful construction to get, it to, get this to work. Anyways. Uh, any questions? And I know I'm kind of rushing a bit because I want to finish in one hour. I just want to say that this is the big thing, right? So this is the big negative result that uh, if the uh, efficient allocation is not monotone, we are in trouble. Okay. And I repeat that once we set out to do to to work on this project, we weren't particularly uh, aware of anything like that. We just wanted to do the general thing and perhaps uh, correct, uh, have sufficient conditions that are more general. But this, the fact that it's a characterization, not of implementability, but of attainability, is something that uh, we didn't sign up for. And I, we, I think it's an important new finding that we, that we didn't expect. Let me put it like that. Okay, so now, now I, I, I stopped for a minute because this is it. This is the uh, life, uh, this is the problem with attainability, but now I'm gonna turn the page. This is the negative thing. I'm gonna turn the page to positive things. As I said, when, when the allocation is monotone, efficient allocation is monotone, life is good. So let me tell you why life is good. Because uh, remember the, the limit auction that I defined a few slides ago, it's easy to construct a monotone equilibrium, the limit auction. Just, uh, just uh, have the signal XI bid the price that would give the, the cutoff, right? And, and if there's no such price, it just bid the like, uh, evaluation at zero or evaluation at one. That's a strictly monotone strategy, type symmetric. Uh, this guy, sigma star, like uh, each one of my brothers use the same sigma I and likewise for J. It's an equilibrium. The clearing price is the rational expectation of equilibrium. 
And under average crossing, which I didn't define, this is actually the unique one. Anyways, uh, this is just a, a like a, a sanity check, right? So under monotonicity, yeah, there's a limiting thing, a, a limit mechanism that achieves, that attains, attains, no, implements the efficient allocation and the rational expectation of the world. Now, that limit object is not a game. It's what is a made up thing that we have. We can use this actually before. I, let, let me just illustrate a few things and, and then I, I use that for, for, for a purpose. Uh, when lambda is less than a third in the example, that thing that I just constructed is just a, the, the guy with private values bids his signal and the guy with interdependent values bids a, a strictly increasing function that follows from the parameters. Uh, when lambda is greater than a third, you can construct an entire family of equilibria. They're all monotone, right? And the important thing is for lambda is less than one, but we fail monotonicity, greater than a third, less than one. The clearing price is strictly monotone. So the clearing price of the limit auction reviews the state, but uh, the allocation that it implements is monotone, right? Uh, the, this is a monotone equilibrium. So you're going to implement a monotone allocation that is not efficient because you already know that the, 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 the efficient allocation is not monotone. So again, to illustrate that the, without monotonicity, there's a whole can of worms. Rational expectations equilibria could need not be unique. They will implement the efficient allocation, but uh, they will achieve the efficient allocation, but the auctions will not. The limit thing will not, you will achieve something else. And to me, when I teach auctions, I, I typically say, well, we want monotone equilibrium because uh, monotone equilibrium is more likely to lead us to efficiency, right? And, uh, or will lead us to efficiency. I would, I, 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 I'm guilty of saying that. And uh, this thing here is saying, no, <laughs> you have monotone equilibrium, of, of course, of this limit object that yields something that is completely inefficient, right? It's monotone and efficient location is not monotone. Yeah, that's what, uh, that's what I just said. So uh, that statement that I teach my students uh, has to be qualified. In the symmetric case, that's true, but if it's asymmetric, not really. Okay, now this was the limit thing. Uh, we can use the limit thing to infer things before the limit, right? So if you view the auction uh, with, N replicas as a game with the trader set being the infinite one, but just uh, with dummy players for players greater than N. Uh, Sigma star is actually a, a, a profile in the final auction. And we have this result that uh, looks like continuity because it is continuity, but the game is discontinued. So there's a proof for that. And right? the result says when alpha is monotone, for any epsilon, there is an N large enough such that the finite large but final auction has an epsilon equilibrium. Actually, not, not only has an epsilon equilibrium, that sigma star is an epsilon equilibrium of that auction. If, uh, if payoffs are continuous, there's a triviality. Payoffs are not continuous, there's a, the, it requires a proof. And actually the same logic says that in the example, the, the family of equilibrium we constructed are also uh, uh, epsilon equilibrium for, for large but final auctions. So in a sense, just saying that the limit object has, is useful. It's not only that you're going to use the, the limit construction to implement something exactly, it gives information for us before the limit. And, and information is, again, if monotonicity fails, we are toast. If monotonicity doesn't fail, we're in, life is good. That's, uh, that's what this is saying. Now, having said that, but, but this was like a sort of a almost immediate uh, uh, thing. Like you have something in the limit, you go a little before, that thing is an approximate equilibrium, right? We can do a little better than that in the spirit of uh, Rennie and Perry. We're going to discretize a whole lot of things. <laughs> we're gonna take a vector of positive numbers, okay? We're gonna discretize states and signals and bids. So uh, zeta zero, zeta i, and zeta are like just the bid increment and the, the signal increment and the state increment. So everything is finite now. You, you just get the distributions like uh, step functions, get a discrete uh, model approximating the, the limit model. Uh, the, and that gamma n z a is the corresponding game with discretized bids and states. Further assumption, z is generic in a sense that I'm not gonna bother you in, in presenting. 
which is just gen generic. Take a generic sequence of numbers that's going to satisfy the condition. The primitives are differentiable, something we hadn't assumed in the beginning. And alpha star is strictly monotone. So this doesn't, uh, we need the, the efficient location to be strictly monotone. Then the theorem that says that the, for large n, this game has a monotone equilibrium. And moreover, the monotonic equilibrium converges to something that we call sigma star Z, Z is the vector. And this sigma star Z converges to the one we constructed as the vector Z, you know, as we populate everything, uh, all the bids and states and signals as the, the, the discretization, discretization goes finer and finer. Uh, this is in the spirit of Rennie and, and Perry, but they, they have, in a sense, a better result because they didn't, don't discretize the, the states and the signals. We do have a result that extends what they have, also only discretizing bids, but for that result, we need to restrict further. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not only that uh, the efficient allocation is, is monotone, we need more than that. It, it's a, it extends what they have, but this one is a little more elegant. And of course, uh, as as the population and the grids grow, you know, grids go fine, fine, and population grows large and large. This converges to to the sigma star that we had before. This implements the rational expectations of equilibrium and efficient allocation. Right. I'm just going to mention one, a few aspects of the proof because the proof is different, is new, uh, and uh, I don't know. It's uh, since this is a theory seminar. I, I hope I, I think I should say something about the structures of proofs. The idea of the proof is this: we take behavior strategies uh, in the discretized setting uh, that only bid around what the rational expectation thing would be. Right? Remember, the rational expectation thing is that uh, you bid your value at the cutoff, so you bid around it, right? Either a little bit below or a bit above, or exactly equal to it depending on, on where the grid is. And then we take a mapping that takes those uh, uh, correspondence that maps those behavior strategies to profiles to profiles of behavior strategies to distribute weights in a way to satisfy efficiency, uh, feasibility, sorry. Because, right, so we, we could be not, we could be allocating more copies than what we had in a, in a given strategy. So this one makes sure that we're not doing that. This mapping is all behavior. It has a fixed point. If you had, so that's so that's where we have an existing thing. We, we have an existence. We have a fixed point argument to construct a kind candidate thing that is this is by construction getting very close to what it, what we want, right? Because it's, it's bidding pretty much the valuation at the cutoff. By construction, it converges to sigma star because sigma star bids the cutoff, right? So we know that the valuation at the cutoff. And now, uh, then, then there's an argument that uh, takes a few pages. If you restrict strategies to a neighborhood of sigma star z, then nobody has a profitable deviation, right? So it, it's an equilibrium of restricted gain, but then we show that uh, the restriction is not binding for a large population. So that's the, the model. Of course, there's a whole lot of steps in, in this thing, but I think I, I would advertise that uh, it's. If you go to, for instance, Rennie and Perry, it's it's like it's a 60, 60 page proof because it's difficult to handle the problems. And we kind of found an, an alternative way of handle the, the lack, uh, bypassing the lack of uh, single crossing conditions. So I think I managed to do that in, half, in less, than, less than an hour. That's good. The conclusion is what I repeated a million times. There is a big negative conclusion here. If, uh, if you go beyond the symmetric case, efficient allocations, regardless of whether they're being, they are achieved, obtainable by rational expectations equilibrium, need not be monotone, and then, then we cannot even achieve them. Rational expectations equilibrium would achieve them, but uh, strategic models wouldn't. So we cannot implement uh, efficient allocations, and therefore we cannot provide strategic foundations for rational expectations equilibrium in general, right? So if, if we have no way of uh, justifying a restriction on the heterogeneity of the traders, then we can. But the positive result is what I just showed you, right? Uh, when you have limited heterogeneity, you don't have the, the example with the, those two polar opposites, 
or very closer to a symmetric situation, then auctions provide statistic foundations for fully revealing <coughs> rational expectations equilibrium, which is uh, induces the efficient allocation. That's it. I rushed to, to finish in 55 minutes. Yeah, so actually you have the five minutes left. Uh, so you, you guys want to know what single crossing, average crossing is? <laughs> what yeah, is? I know, right, whatever you want, if you have one. No, nah, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. Uh, uh, you're on? You're on? So let me ask the broader philosophical question, which is that in the example that you cooked up mm -hmm. um, with traders one and traders two, it feels like somebody should be able to make a lot of money by improving the efficiency of the mechanism. And, and so, you know, we have investment advisors in the real world. We have people who gather information on our behalf and help us to make better decisions. And, mm -hmm. and so it, it feels somehow as if, you know, for example, a few of the traders, one could band together, look at their signals, extract Omega, and then sell that knowledge to traders too for a little bit per trader, but a lot in total mm -hmm. and, and, and do better than trading themselves. And, and so I was wondering in particular about, uh, imagine that you made these mechanisms asymmetric in the following way. What mm -hmm. you did was for each class of traders, for each I, you mm -hmm. took a small fraction of the traders Mm -hmm. uh, a fraction which is going to zero as the number gets large, but that is growing in absolute size. Mm -hmm. And you told you told these people, you're just not trading. You're not trading at all. Please mm -hmm. tell us your please tell us your signal. Okay. And you use the signals that that small group of traders who are not going to trade at all, so they're happy to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And you use that to guide a non-monotone allocation for everyone else. That, that feels almost like, you know, a small part of the population has gone into the consulting business, basically. <laughs> yeah, that... no, that's the, uh, I, I uh, okay, you, you, you have more to say? I, I think that- No, that's no, that's it. Because what you're telling us is like, uh, uh, if I got it correctly, so take an asymmetric mechanism and, and are you looking for epsilon implementability? Is that what you're saying? I, I think what I'm doing, yes, I'm looking for absolute unimplementability and I'm breaking PRI in a particular way that honestly feels kind of natural because this idea that people can make money directly by trading, but they can also make money by advising other people's trading on the basis of knowing something seems somehow quite natural. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, I, we haven't worked on that. It's a, <laughs> It sounds like a pretty natural thing to to. to True. Well, let, let me let me let me flip the question then a bit. If you were asking, you know, you've got this negative result that mechanisms yeah. that satisfy PRI fail in a lot of settings. Yeah. How would you try to retrieve a positive result if you if you were inclined to do so? What do you think needs to change to get to efficiency? Um, what I uh, our attempts were in in dynamic mechanisms, right? Okay. So we were. I mean, we look at the stock market, we kind of feel that it's, a, it's an auction, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a dynamic thing, right? There is a, right. a sell by sell by sell. So uh, our, our first, uh, my first hunch is that this one may be efficient. There's yeah. information revealed along the way, and maybe that's what you're doing like that. You, you're proxying it with the advisors, right? So, yeah. So I, I guess your yours is a, is a smarter way of uh, trying to mimic a dynamic version. So, yeah. That, that's that I would you know we want to say that, that this is a big blow to competitive uh, to efficient market hypothesis but markets operate on on that right we 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 talk to one another right so and I guess talking to one another in the trade floor is one thing and talking to one another through a mediator is is a is a proxy for that right that's what you're saying right yeah so the last thing I'm going to say is that Paolo was too too modest um the Perry Rennie paper, including online appendices, is 105 pages of really complicated limit arguments. And one of the things that's just beautiful about this paper is the way that you can sort of just cut to the quick by mm -hmm. using tools. I think that's just super impressive and 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 sets the stage not for this paper, but potentially for a lot of you know uh, further work in this area. So I, I think this is you know breaking free of literature, which was pretty stuck. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Nice, nice paper. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and and sure. I mean, I think uh, your suggestion is, uh, is 
Because, you know, we did think about dynamics, but we did not know how to do it, to be honest. <laughs> we did not know how to to model this this trading floor thing. And maybe the best, uh, your way is, is a much more efficient way. It's just a, a sort of fraction of guys that uh, will do something and review the state, and uh, which is what uh, it's pretty. That's a good idea. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, um, any other questions? Angel? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a question that, that always puzzles me about uh, about these exercises that you have done. I mean, it seems it plays a role, no? Or at least it appears in some of the discussion that, that, that you did, no? Which is that, you know, I mean, again, I may, I may have something confused on, on the interpretation, but I had the impression that the, the way, I mean, for instance, in your result, that uh, in the pseudo limit game or in the this game in defining the limit somehow, okay, that there is an equilibrium in which people bid the, the rational expectations equilibrium price, okay, uh, seems to be on the fact that uh, under your assumptions in the limit, the agents know exactly where they are in the distribution of type uh, the, of agents. But they know exactly the ranking in the distribution of agents. Is that isn't that true? No, I don't no. think it's true. No, I mean, what what we do in the limit? We we take a well uh, because tell me. Yeah, no, I mean, what uh, what, uh, what we compute in the limit is uh, uh, because of, because of type symmetric strategies, we 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 can. Uh, we can come up with that row infinity, that price thing that uh, that gets the information of everybody else. So maybe that's what you're, you're referring to. So yes, okay, everybody's okay, yes. Yeah, that, go ahead. So I don't okay. know my position. What I know is my signal, my V relative to to the, the, the price that I can't affect in the limit is just okay. what people did, right? Okay, so... Uh... So the problem I have in understanding this result is I think I'm thinking of the following example. Suppose that there are two possible distributions for the distribution for the types of the buyers. Okay, suppose that there is only you know some non-strategic sellers, okay, and two potential distributions for the for the buyers. Say with probability a half, we have a uniform between zero and one, and with probability say a half, no, I mean the, the half we have a distribution say between 0 0.5 and 1.5. Okay, mm -hmm. so depending on on whether we are in one distribution or another, and of course depending on the on the supply, okay, we're going to have a, a, a rational expectation equilibrium in the limit or another. Okay, no, what what do you mean by that? I mean the distributions are are you know you get your signal and and you are, it's type dependent, right? So what, what are those two distributions? There are two types of players and each one has a diff different distribution? As no, no, I mean, the, the game, I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm proposing, I think I'm proposing a model that is not within your assumptions. Oh, okay. okay. I, I'm not, and I'm not sure where it fails, okay? Yeah, okay. So, so my question is perhaps, I mean, I'm hoping that perhaps you realize where it fails or where my logic fails, okay? okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, assume, I mean, assume that basically there is only one type of buyers, okay? Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, this type of bias is basically drawn, its value is drawn from a uniform distribution between zero and one. Okay. Or with, that occurs with probability a half, or with probability a half, it is drawn from another distribution, say between uh, 0 0.5 and 1.5. Okay? Okay. And now, once we fix the distribution, then when we take the limit game, no? We start replicating the economy, okay? But even yeah. in the limit, we may no, we be drawing types, okay? No, we wouldn't do that. I mean, your formulation would uh, collapse to ours. Uh, uh, we have one distribution that uh, that uh, incorporates both, right? So, uh, and maybe depends on the state. Let's say there are two states. Nope. In one state, we're using one distribution. In the other state, we're using the other. That That's a special case of our model. And we would go to the limit with this distribution that uh, is conditioned on the state. The condition of state we're using either zero to one or half to one point five. So it will be, and we replicate okay, this see. one condition on I the state distribution. Okay. But then I mean, uh, what if the rational expectation equilibrium depends on the state? Okay. Yeah. 
Definitely. So how can then what I don't understand is how the agents can predict what the state is going to be, that, because you know that I mean. No, they don't predict. Because, right? So they estimate. They don't. So how, okay, they, but they, they, they need to. That, that's the thing. My, there's a correlation between signals and states. I get my signal. I make an estimate of the state, and from that estimate, I can make the expected payoff computation and decide whether I want or or I, or I don't want the object because the price I cannot affect. So this, this is all in, in the but, but what I understood is that in the limit game, okay, they actually beat their rational expectation equilibrium price. So didn't I get it right? No, 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 that's a result. We construct a clearing price. It is a made up clearing price that clears markets. <laughs> it's, oh, sorry, it, I misunderstood. Okay, no, 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 it. it's not that. Okay, no, I no. thought that they were bidding the price. No, 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 no. Oh, I, I mean, see, I see. No. I thought that with the limit game, where they were bidding the price, that was confusion. No, no, sorry. no. What they're bidding is the is the value at the cutoff, right? So okay, I see. So is it, oh, sorry about that. But but the construction of the limit object is a little. I mean, we know what we're getting, right? So we, we want to satisfy feasibility. So that's how the clearing price is. I see. And, and they take that price as given and just, just, just bid according to expected valuation. Yeah, okay, now I got it, sorry. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, I have another question. I mean, that, that this is more, uh, and it's probably it's because I forgot, I mean, the details of the definition of PRI. Okay, mm -hmm. so I guess you are allowing for dynamic games and for uh, mixed strategies in, oh, in the auctions. Okay, I, that's what I didn't get. Okay, well, definitely. When we talk, I was I was a little too quick here when I talked about the mechanism. There's a message space. It's abstract, and players send messages, but they can we allow them to to send mixed messages and and type asymmetric messages. Along the way, in the limit, and, it, and and is it obvious that in this complicated message space, auctions must be must have the PRI property? No, auctions message space is real, real numbers. Auctions are trivial. No, I mean think of a dynamic auction. No, it's not, in a no, mix. Not, not at all. You're you're more than right. No, uh, it's like a, this condition is is again as a referee said this that may be a dumb property of auctions. Uh, it, it's once you think of cash bids, you're like, yeah, it must. But if you're talking about a like crazy, you know, a normal form of a, of a complex dynamic game, I don't know. So that, that's your yeah, question. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of a dynamic auction. A dynamic auction has a very complicated normal form. And in that complicated normal form, I mean, the messages are not, at least I cannot think of them as, um, as real numbers. Of course they're not, they're, they're, they're the strategies. There's the contingent plans. Of course they're not. Okay. Right? So, yeah, of course, the contingent plans, strategies, real valid strategy, not really, taking an ascending price, it's just yes or no, right? It's depending on where you are. It's, it's a complicated function, cert certainly. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the comments. <clears throat> so in terms of the dynamic uh, setting, so in terms of updating, so any any type of updating is also allowed. So it's very general in terms of that. At this point, M is abstract. M can be as as general as as, as you want. We're not telling what you want. <laughs> it's just an abstract message space. It could be a very complicated Bayesian game, dynamic Bayesian game. It could be. Yeah, then, then you you guys are touching the the right question. I mean, what is PRI there? Right? What, what, what kind of a Restriction does it impose in a very particular dynamic setting? That's what you're asking. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of the, so I guess the rational explanation of equilibria, the nice thing is that the fully informative is about information aggregation in some sense, right? Information uh, revelation? Information aggregation. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, the rational expectation of equilibrium, you, you got the state. I mean, it's, it's an increasing function. You see that the number, you know what the state is. It's uh, that that that's the it's that's the one we want to uh, right. It's, it's revealing the inform the hidden information in the economy. Yeah. Okay. So if we have uh, no question, we can stop the live recording. Okay. So thank you very much, Paolo. Thank you, guys. Should I stop sharing? Um.